Hot uranium stocks are the topic of today's presentation. If you're somebody that's thinking about investing in uranium stocks, you'll want to watch this because we look at the bull thesis and more importantly, the different ways that you can invest in uranium. So it's no secret that investors see uranium as having potential. You could see this article from Bloomberg, hedge funds pile into uranium stocks set for dramatic rise. Uh, uranium prices have soared 125% over the past three years. So um, there are reasons for that. Now, what this video is, it's a basic introduction to the bull thesis. More importantly, we look at what investment options exist and why you might want to choose from these various options. This video is for the thousands of paying subscribers who pay our bills, many of whom we interact with on our Discord server and who raised this as a topic that we, we may want to talk about. I'll note that uh, we have about 2,400 written research pieces here at Analyze. One of those in the past was about uranium, and uh, we were lambasted when we published that because uh, all the experts out there wanted to point out the things that we didn't include. This is a 10 or 15 minute video. It's not meant to include everything. It's uh, an introduction to the uranium thesis as it exists today. Now, when we look at world energy and nuclear power, electric demand is increasing about twice as fast as overall energy use. It's likely to rise by more than half to 2040. So of the electricity that we're producing, about 10% of that across the globe comes from nuclear. If you just look at the OECD countries, so the more developed markets, that's about 18%. So almost all reports on future energy supply suggest an increasing role for nuclear power as an environmentally benign way of producing reliable electricity on a large scale. Now, that's where things start to uh, get a little dicey. So I took this slide from Sprott's deck. We'll talk about who they are. It says, why invest in uranium now? It describes nuclear energy as one of the cleanest energy sources and safest. And that's, of course, where everybody will start arguing. And um, this heralds back to a piece we did on whether nuclear is uh, green energy or not, or clean energy. And that's a debate that's a, a completely different debate to be had. But uh, regardless, uh, the uh, projections are that nuclear energy uh, generation will more than double by 2050, with 30 countries increasing their usage. And at this point here, the Russia-Ukraine war has created an urgent energy crisis. We want to talk about that because the problem's not so apparent. Uh, nuclear fuel supply security is vital, and that's a given, right? If you're a country that's producing nuclear energy, you want to make sure that you have that fuel for your reactors, the uranium. Uh, concerns over supply security persist, and it says the G7 have pledged to end reliance on Russian uranium and fuel services. We'll talk about that. At 2022, saw the most uranium contracted in 10 years, perhaps as a result of what we just talked about. Uh, utilities are likely to buy more uranium for supply security and price stability. Now, uranium demand isn't price sensitive as the fuel costs minimally impact nuclear plant profitability, unlike a coal plant where that uh, in, impacts the profitability significantly. Now, existing uranium supply may fall short of future needs, and that's where some of the speculation is here around future prices. Now, when we look at nuclear reactors in the world today, you can see this nice chart that shows where they're at. Uh, again, nuclear, about 9 to 10 percent of total uh, energy electric generation in uh, across the globe. You see here there are 434 operational reactors, uh, eight, 59 under construction, and 111 planned for construction. So when we look at the price of uranium, it's important to note this doesn't trade on an open market like other commodities. So buyers and sellers will negotiate contracts privately, so there isn't as much transparency into the price action. Here you can see the charts there in the center, uranium spot price, and on the right, the monthly price of uranium worldwide from January 2020, going back to that point about how it's increased. Now, when we look at who's producing uranium, so this is broken down on a country basis. On the left, you can see Kazakhstan absolutely dominating with over half of all uranium production. Then there's Namibia, Canada, Australia, Uzbekistan. Look where Russia sits. So they're down there in sixth place. So that may, may make you wonder, well, it should be pretty easy to crowd them out from a geopolitical standpoint. Well, not necessarily. That's because there's more to the uranium supply chain than meets the eye. 
Russia supplied the U.S. nuclear industry with about 12 percent of its uranium last year. So uh, there's definitely a dependency. Now, when you look at the table on the right, you can see the production by company. So you see the Kazakh company there at the top, the uh, predominant producer. Then you have Cameco. That's uh, a firm we're going to touch on today. And then you go down this list. So there are a handful of producers that dominate production. Now, this piece that we're going to look at here, we took some charts from it, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. I'm not familiar with this source, but I really enjoyed this graphic here. It says Russia's stranglehold on the world's nuclear power cycle, and they provide a few charts that show why that is. Here you can see uh, world uranium conversion capacity. So these are activities that take place after the raw material has been mined. You can see Russia dominating there at 38% of conversion capacity. These are 2020 numbers, but it's unlikely this has changed very much. And then look to the right of that, world uranium enrichment capacity. There's Russia again, 46%. So they're far more active in the uranium supply chain than meets the eye if you're just looking at production numbers. So when we think about the uranium thesis, do you want to just invest in the raw material or do you want to invest in uranium producers that occupy the entire supply chain, so mining, conversion, and enrichment? Would you want to invest in an ETF or a leader? So if you're looking at leaders, Cameco is a $18 billion company. It dwarfs its closest publicly traded rivals. Um, if you're going to invest in a leader, make sure it's, it lives in developed markets with low geopolitical risk. And Cameco is a, a Canadian firm. Now, when we look at share price action here. It's no surprise to see that over the past five years, the shares of Cameco have gone up uh, quite a bit there. You see 200 and nearly 250% compared to uh, the that URA, that's a uranium ETF at about 107%. So that's the benchmark that you would use to see how well Cameco has performed. And then, of course, I just threw up NASDAQ as a point of reference, 72% there. So uh, just real quickly, we have a newsletter here at Nanalyze that we published for uh, uh, over 16,000 uh, readers. Go ahead and subscribe to that. So we put out a lot of interesting content about once a week on the written research that we produce. YouTube is a very small part of what we do. Uh, I'm going to put a link in the description of this video at the top there. Just click that link, sign up to Nanalyze Weekly, please, and support our work. We don't run ads. We need your help to spread our messages. So. When we look at uranium ETFs here, you can see there are two main ETFs. The Global X is the one that you want to pay attention to because they have uh, the most assets under management. And the first thing you might notice here is that they're not all that different. So the Global X ETF there, you can see, is very heavily weighted. Cameco at the top at 22%. Then there's Sprott's Physical Uranium Trust. We're going to talk about that. And then there's the Kazakh firm there in third place. And then to the right of that, you see a table that shows the breakdown for the other ETF. And they're more heavily weighting the Kazakh firm there, Cameco in second place, and then Sprott. And the differences between these two, I pointed out, are two firms, Yellowcake and CGN Mining, that um, can be found or not found in either of these ETFs. Now, when we look at Sprott, they're an asset manager with about $25 billion in assets under management. They're publicly listed on the New York Stock Exchange and Canadian Exchange. Uh, one of their listed products here is a physical uranium trust. So that's an option for investors if you're interested in investing in um, the world's largest physical uranium fund. Here are the ticker symbols. You can see the market value of uranium held by the trust. And of course, the net asset value should be about the same there. Expense ratio, 70 basis points. That's pretty cheap. I mean, that's not, uh, that's not that bad. So it's certainly a reasonable option. And when you invest in this uh, physical uranium trust, you're investing in what's called yellow cake. And this is a great diagram that shows, remember we talked about conversion and enrichment. Well, look, at you have the exploration that results in the yellow cake, and then it goes into refining, conversion, and enrichment. That's when it starts to go through the supply chain there all the way until when it's used in a nuclear reactor. So if you were to invest in this trust, you'd be missing out on those steps. So the uranium thesis is basically there aren't that many pure play nuclear stocks out there. We've looked at that because subscribers have asked. Uranium is used almost entirely for electricity generation and nuclear power plants. So while plants are becoming more efficient, uh, there is a need to displace Russia from the supply chain. So you really have three options here. 
Invest in the largest mining company, invest in the largest ETF, or invest in Sprott's physical uranium trust. But if uranium is what you want exposure to, then that trust is going to make sense. It's the purest play. But mining would be investing in the leverage on that uranium price and also that full supply chain. However, it contains company-specific risk if you just pick one leader. So then you're back to investing in multiple mining companies and you're back at that ETF. So there's a, a number of options there for investors. You see this chart here by Sprott that shows the previous bull markets and the sort of action that we've seen there. This is a commodity. So all this talk about, you know, uh, speculation on future price movements is, is rather pointless. Uh, investing in a commodity that's expected to increase in price doesn't fit into our overall investing strategy, though I would say commodities have a place in a diversified portfolio as an alternative asset. You could certainly make a case for that. Cameco seems to be increasing based on anticipated revenue growth. Uh, it may merit a second look, so we get enough interest in this video from the people who pay our bills, and maybe we'll do a follow-up on Cameco. We wanted to uh, set the groundwork first by looking at the bull thesis. And the purest play for uranium, of course, would be Sprott's fund, while a vertically, vertically integrated leader in a developed market would be most appealing from our perspective. Now, I'm going to put up another video here that you might want to watch. Before you click that, please click the Analyze logo on the right. Subscribe, support our channel. We don't run ads. We need your help. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.